So welcome to anyone who's just joined us. We will start in a couple of minutes. You can see all our attendees joining us. Welcome, thanks for coming. We'll start in a couple of minutes. Just give people a few more minutes to come in. Welcome, if you just missed this minute joined us, we'll be starting in a minute or so. Okay, I think the joining rate is gradually slowing. I think we've nearly got everyone here, but let's just wait a minute more just to make sure everyone's in who wants to be in and we'll start in a minute. Right, well, I think we should start um, and then others can join us as we go. Uh, so a very well, warm welcome to everyone, to our panellists and to all our attendees. Many thanks to co for coming to this conversation. Uh, my name is Bridget Eskam and I'll be lightly chairing um, our panel today and hopefully joining in a bit as well. Um, and uh, as you will know, our conversation is called I'm Thirsty. It's about reclaiming water and the arts as universal common goods. Um, so. Um, our question is, uh, our broader question is really what does water have in common with the arts and we're really excited to be engaged in a conversation today about the mutual challenges and opportunities faced by those who believe that both water and the arts should be reclaimed as universal common goods accessible to all. And the people that we've got in the room here as panelists for you today are already working in cross-disciplinary conversations, uh, two of them in a project that brings together water and the arts in very real terms, as, as you'll see. Uh, and I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. And then we'll have another round of contributions in which everyone speaks in more depth about their current projects, um, after which we'll move into more conversational mode, drawing links between the projects, uh, our work and our philosophies, and we'll be building on the premise that as much as water is indispensable to our survival, so are the arts, and yet both are dangerously devalued in our society. Um, during the um, uh, presentations and the conversation, as people have already started to do, please do introduce yourself if you're a, an attendee. So that'd be fantastic, I can already see that happening. Um, and um, also, uh, people are very welcome to use the Q&A function. And that's where I hope to find questions for the panelists a bit later in the session. Uh, so if we could chat in chat uh, and put questions directly to the panelists in the Q&A, and you'll see that at the bottom of your screen where all the um, uh, chat button and uh, uh, live transcript strict, uh, live transcript excuse me and um, participant buttons are you'll see a button q a um, so if you'd like to ask a question to any of the panelists don't wait for q a at the end you're welcome to put it in at any time um, i'll be keeping an eye on that and if there's a question that seems particularly pertinent to something that we're saying in the moment i might bring that question in uh, but otherwise we will also leave some uh, time at the end for attendees to ask questions. Um, I guess it really varies from event to event, event how many questions uh, there are and how complex they are to answer. Um, so many apologies in advance if we don't get to yours, but hopefully we will get to them all. 
Um, so uh, let's start by just introducing ourselves, if we could. Um, I'll start by um, saying that I'm uh, in the drama department um, and um, my research has mainly been in theatre history with a more recent emphasis on representations health and mental illness um, in, the th in theatre and performance, both in historical practice and contemporary performance practice. Um, could I ask um, Megan to introduce herself? Hi, I'm Megan Clinch. Um, I'm a senior lecturer over in the Institute of Population Health Sciences at QM. I'm a social anthropologist and I'm particularly interested in um, situations um, in which evidence um, construct people can how people construct evidence and when different ideas about what is good and bad evidence clash, usually in a clinical or public health environment. So shall I pass over on to Ruth? Yes, lovely. Thanks, Megan. Hi, uh, my name is Ruth Levine. I'm an artist based in Sheffield and my work manifests as video, walking, mapping, performance and dialogue. And often all of these things come together under a longer research based participatory or collective project. I'm interested in complex systems that we've created um, that or that have evolved um, that are no longer working and that are odds with sustaining life on the planet. Um, I particularly focus on water and wheat and increasingly my work um, tries to collectively explore, experiment um, new or create new spaces and ways of doing things um, whilst revealing and critiquing current systems. Fantastic, thanks Ruth. Louise, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, hi there, my name is Louise Uni. I'm a GP academic working at Barts and the London um, Queen Mary and um, have been passionate about creative inquiry and making space for creative inquiry that is engagement with lived experience through art making of any in any um, of the arts for over 15 years and in particular I'm interested in two areas that's um, development of practice so understanding ourselves as practitioner and practitioner ways of knowing through the arts as well as human flourishing um, through the arts and creative processing. Fantastic, thanks Louise. Maria. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Maria Grazia Turri and uh, I'm a lecturer at the Center for Psychiatry at Queen Mary. Uh, my background is uh, I've worked in mental health uh, for 15 years in psychiatry and psychotherapy. And I'm also a theatre scholar and I'm interested in unconscious processes in spectatorship. And uh, these two sides of myself have come together uh, as an interdisciplinary um, area uh, where I uh, co-direct with Bridget the MSc in Creative Arts and Mental Health. And I'm really interested in the role that the arts have in mental health, uh, particularly in relation to emotions. Fantastic. Thank you, Maria. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, so I wonder if first I could turn back to um, to Megan and Ruth um, and whether you could tell us something about your research exploring the impact of flooding. Um, and um, I know that you've been working with communities to reconnect with the idea of water in response to climate change. So it would be really exciting for us to kick off and hear something about that project. Yeah, OK. Um, shall I start, Megan? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. OK, so it's probably good to just give you a bit of context. Um, the um, project that we've been working on um, was uh, commissioned by Arts Catalyst and as part of their test site series and um, it's been going since a long time, <laughs> 2017 and it's just sort of being tied up now. Um, uh, we initially came to the project, um, we met on the project so we didn't know each other, Megan and I. I came to the project having just completed a residency in the Faculty of um, Engineering, Civil Engineering at the University of Sheffield, um, particularly working with a group called Pennine Water Group. So my understanding and learning of water really came through an engineering lens and a pipe uh, lens and a city lens and I was really really ready to kind of explore the wider governance of water and come out of that uh, infrastructure and start to look at it from what would be called a catchment perspective. 
and one of the reasons I was really keen to do that and frame this project in that way was that I realized that once you kind of broaden out um, into a sort of geographical area like a catchment you start to reveal the um, the different kind of values and policies that are laid on the different kind of ways we manage the land as well as the rivers as, as well as the canals as well as the kind of drinking water and um, that that was a starting point to explore the contradictions and tensions between all of those different things. Okay um, and I'll just add a little bit to what I came to the project with. So I came to the project off the couple of a uh, couple of other research projects that I've been working on. So one was looking at um, a, a, the Life Sciences Initiative at QM, which um, we were trying to explore what does it mean to be an interdisciplinary biomedical scientist, what are the challenges and tensions of doing that, um, and to what extent can it work. Um, at the other project I was also looking at was something um, where we were looking at what we called liminal hotspots and liminal situations, so it was a group of us who were interested in these really difficult intractable practice situations um, where professionals and their clients kind of really got stuck and couldn't really go on anymore in their professional practice. So there I was looking at kind of um, the tensions between doctors and patients around kind of diagnostic evidence and when, when that became a problem. And I think that gave me an interest, not in water, but it did give me an interest in um, looking at institutions and organizations that were attempting to bring different kinds of knowledge making together how that often tripped them up, but also I was looking at institutions and organisations that might be struggling in terms of resource, so for example the NHS or local authorities as well, and actually these two things, as we'll kind of describe later, link um, quite well with the colder catch, but not, not necessarily water, so I'll hand back to Ruth and just help so she can tell you a little bit about what we did. Okay, I'm going to try and explain this as quick as I can because it's quite a long, complex project. <laughs> so please excuse me. But um, so really, we went in with this idea of like, why is flooding happening and who's responsible? But it was very much in the kind of wider water context. Um, and so, you know, Calder has always been flooded, like many other places, flooding has always happened, but of, um, due to climate change, it's getting the storms are getting much more intense. So we started in 2017 by essentially immersing ourselves in the everyday. Um, we did, uh, we hired a canal boat for a few weeks, we lived on it, we invited people on board, we um, visited different locations and we started to um, uh, look at um, policy and, and visited local libraries and looking at, lo looked at local history. Um, so we went on um, later on in the following year to um, essentially um, look at um, a wider set of tools to do that. Um, so from my perspective, I started to create, um, as you see behind me, a, a stratification layer cake to explore the geology. These are ways of just engaging and inviting people into the conversation, but there are also ways by which we could learn ourselves. Um, why um, why flooding was happening. Um, we uh, and Megan um, started to um, sort of make the uh, start the interviews that were already happening but she kind of formalized them and kind of led on those interviews and I had to learn very quickly to be quiet in those interviews um, <laughs> and uh, uh, and we attended local festivals and kind of just sort of hung out and 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 carried on chatting with people and there was many kind of tools and models and and things made um, and this was really important that this was not just from a kind of um, residence perspective but we we were worked quite hard at kind of getting statutory organisations involved, professionals, water companies. Um, and um, so we got a kind of quite a broad spectrum of the people that were actually involved in flood management in the Calder. And then what started to happen was, um, you know, we'll talk about this probably later in the discussion, but our practices, you know, even though the conversations were always mixing up, our practices had, was still kind of like parallel with each other and at some point they started to kind of cross over and start to um we started to collaborate and um we started to kind of from the data that we were finding we started to sort of discuss um and look at the reframing and um troubling on the the troubling and reflecting differences um that we were finding um so this was kind of when we started to make um um a, a model 
which included a series of miniatures and each of those miniatures were a result of the interviews that Megan had done. So some of the key concerns or issues or objects or things that were coming out. And these miniatures, um, as well as uh, Megan's analysis started to kind of like be the basis of these role playing games essentially. Um, using this model where the conversation could be expanded more we could look at cause and consequence we could look at the wider picture we could look at the complexities and um, explore things from other people's perspectives so all this came together um, in a, a video report because obviously covid had set in um, by 20 20 um, and we um, sent a report which really brought all of the, our ideas together but also what we found and what we would, had been told and from that we did the final stage which was um, essentially taking all this data exploring what everyone had said and then trying to work with them to imagine a better future and a new way of doing things and that became um, a common waters policy and um, then from and that was a whole series of Zoom conversations where people kind of went back and forth to explore kind of how we could basically write a policy. We wrote the policy and then they agreed the policy. And that's where we came to at the end. So I'll take that back to you, Megan. Is Thank that right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just staring into the screen at these beautiful things. Um, I, I wonder if we might now uh, move to Louise Uni to talk about her, what, I think is pioneering creative inquiry work um, with, and I know um, Maria agrees with me, with medical students and health professionals. Um, Louise. There we go, sorry. Um, after screen sharing, I was looking for the unmute. So, um, yeah, so as I said, I've been engaging with this creative inquiry process for about 15 years and, and um, the images that I'm showing, I've just got three, are all from medical students. Um, one thing I always say when I'm sharing the images that um, I do choose the aesthetic ones um, for presentations because they're uh, good to look at, but uh, with the students, I talk a lot about it being about process rather than outcome. So it's a, a process focused, uh, engagement with creative exploration in a kind of improvisational, even playful way, which I guess comes in the opposite spirit of much of medical education, where students are trying to find the right answer, give the correct answer, um, be the best they can be. It's a very competitive and knowledge and skills based environment. So this comes in the opposite spirit. And the image here, I, I often use this image, um, it's from about over 10 years ago. To explore, to explain the term really, creative inquiry, which um, that exploring of lived experience through the arts. And this was done by a student who was an artist. She'd done, um, you know, she was familiar with painting, but she'd never tried creative inquiry, which she encountered on one of the student selected components that I was running. And, and through the writing, so you see here, she describes that when she picks up the pen, that her, and as she starts to write, that her identity becomes revealed to her. So initially the hair is covering her face, but as she writes, the face emerges 3D from the paper. And so she's, she's sort of conveying one of the core um, elements of creative inquiry in that it offers um, new perspective, new understanding on yourselves, on others, um, which can be emergent in a kind of transformative way. So um, that's the first image. And then um, to explain how I've been working, I've, I've basically tried to, I mean, earlier Ruth was talking about spaces and creating spaces, and I've been trying to create these creative inquiry spaces like little watering holes across um, medical education wherever I can. So in the first year GP attachment that I was running at the University of Bristol a long time ago, um, I introduced creative inquiry rather than reflection, a, a written reflection on a patient home visit for first year medical students. And um, students were initially writing sort of fairly dry reflections like Mr. S um, visits, uh, has got diabetes and he takes these medications and, and he sees these professionals. And when I opened the door to um, creative inquiry, and it's a throwaway almost in the first year, having done haikus with our GP tutors, and then we thought we'd, we'd introduce this. 
So in the first year students did, there was a few narratives. And then as I started to nurture this as a, as a gardener, perhaps the next year there was um, some poems and a few pictures. And then the next year, some sculptures and, and music and gradually music and dance and all the various arts. And, and this was part of my you know, studying what the students were learning through this kind of work um, as part of my doctoral research. And, and one of the big things that came out was um, exploration of the patient voice and the student voice. And both of them could be heard much louder, if you like, or much more clearly from the student work. So here, um, the student was exploring the light at the end of the tunnel that the patient talked about not being, having been able to see at one point in her life, having had a traumatic and difficult past. But the student also reflects on the, the style of painting, the colors, the heavy colors that, that you see there. Um, because it felt quite heavy listening to um, the, the patient narrative. She's also painted in the Vincent van Gogh style, which was her favorite artist. Um, but also he has his own history of, of mental health, obviously. And um, the, the, the figure that's slumping might be the patient, but also might be the student after listening um, to to what had happened in this lady's life. So we, we hear both the patient voice and the student voice coming through here. And, and part of the practitioner development work um, that I've been doing, I guess it, it, it started from when I became a GP, thinking that a good doctor is one who knows the facts, knows the skills, makes the diagnosis. And of course, general practice is much more complex and messy than that. And, and I'm sure many other um, practitioners can resonate with the complexity and the messiness, but there is little space as even my creative arts students today were saying that there isn't these kinds of spaces to explore practice. And so I talk about understanding the disease as well as understanding the person, uh, the other and, and understanding ourselves. And so I try to create those spaces that might enhance and enrich our practices. And finally, um, I run a student selected component which I've been doing for 15 years um, with Arts for Health um, consultants and arts therapists of different kinds, patient artists, clinicians, artists, um, and Maria also uh, facilitated this year as well, which was wonderful. Um, and through that process, in fact, I just had the last session of my two weeks today with my first year medical students and um, totally blown away, probably the best group I've ever had. Um, but, but some of what happens is through the creative inquiry process, through me creating a safe space, um, so vulnerable leadership, creating a transformative space where students um, can express and explore through different languages, um, this kind of thing emerges. And so here you might or might not be able to see a little tiny black fish in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, there it is, that was, that was how the medical student felt herself. And then all the other bright and colored fishes were all the other medical students. But in producing this piece, um, this resonated very strongly across the other medical students there. And uh, many of them wrote in their reflective journal that, that they felt similarly and some actually shared in the group as well. These sorts of things are not often talked about in a, in a course that is obviously has a lot of macho competition and ranking um, uh, scoring all their scores. So, and from that can come uh, uh, flourishing. And I talk about, um, the well-being of what is, not the well-being of, you know, you must sleep well and eat well and do lots of running and all of those other things, but there's a well-being that comes when we can be real about some of the stuff that's going on for us and we share it and we realize that we're all carrying our own burdens. As one of our students shared today, she had a black and white um, collage with a, with a person carrying the world and described, you know, that she has whatever particular burden it was, but also recognizing that we all and all the medical students are carrying their own stuff, um, but it very rarely is talked about. Perhaps that's enough of an introduction. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, I'm going to move on to Maria now. Perhaps you could introduce us to some of your work in, in the arts and mental health. Um, yes, I, I was thinking that um, there are a lot of um, cross um, fertilizations between all these things we've been talking about. And for me, um, the most uh, important one is around the liminality. So the spaces in between where um, we can really uh, discover and accept these multiple perspectives. 
And so I'm, I'm coming to it from my background as a psychiatrist. And uh, I am now part of a network of psychiatrists called the Critical Psychiatry Network, uh, because I'm very critical of the way in which uh, we currently think about conceptualize mental health as some kind of disease uh, that is within people's brains. Um, and uh, the way we practice it as well, uh, not so much because the people in the system, in my opinion, um, want to practice it in the wrong way, but because the system is pushing all of us to, pra to practice it in a very reductionist way. And for me, the liminality was very important was I, when I was working as a psychiatrist. Um, so one of the main areas of practice for me was uh, family therapy. Um, or taking a family therapy approach to our work uh, because that allows people to come together uh, in, a, um, in a dialogue, in a space, in a liminal space where all perspectives are valued. And so I'm a big uh, fan of open dialogue, which is a new, um, well, it's not a new, <laughs> it's quite an aged uh, system for looking at mental health as a, a place where different narratives meet and uh, where these uh, narratives through dialogue are actually the healing place of mental health. And so that's my sort of um, perspective from a psychiatry uh, lens. Uh, and I am very critical of things like uh, labels and very fixed diagnostic uh, practices where basically people are put in boxes uh, rather than let uh, them uh, explore themselves uh, in a multiple perspective way. And I'm not against uh, helping people who suffer, of course, uh, we need to provide help, but it's the kind of help that we provide, I think, that I'm questioning. Um, and uh, I guess in terms of, of my work with the arts, um, I, in the uh, MSc, I encourage students to explore the intersection between the arts and mental health in many different ways. We know about the um, most typical way is uh, offering the arts as a therapeutic tool uh, to people who suffer, which is absolutely a great way of doing it and very legitimate. But I was very, very uh, enthusiastic from the beginning about, for example, Louise's work because um, the art engagement allows a different uh, perspective to be taken by the health professionals themselves. So for example, I uh, convened for a number of years um, uh, continuing professional development activity, which was psychiatrists going to an art gallery and actually reflecting on their practice by um, confronting uh, objects that uh, were art objects and were picked by a teaching curator to speak to a theme. Uh, but of course, what we put in those conversations was completely uh, free floating and showed the space of liminality that art can, can provide really clearly because uh, psychiatrists were talking about many diverse things from their own personal um, experiences to their professional practice, to their um, understanding or, or lack of understanding of the art object through to questions about the meaning of life, you know? <laughs> so, so all mm. these things are not separate, separate within us. They all influence each other. They all come together. And I think art is just that place where we can do those um, those ways of, of creating and thinking in a different way. Yeah, I'll stop it there. That's great. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, and ever since, for, for the purposes of this conversation, I've been thinking about the links between the arts and water. Uh, at first, I thought, well, we'll have a conversation that uh, starts from the premise that both are essential and both should be common goods and both aren't necessarily always. Um, but actually, what's so, so fascinating uh, talking to uh, you all previously and just now is that the, the continual way in which 
wastewater becomes a helpful metaphor for talking about these things. So uh, you've just talked about a free floating process. And I keep thinking about flow as opposed to dry atomization. So if, um, if you wouldn't mind me just coming out of chair mode for a second, I'll sort of explain my own place here. Uh, my early career was in uh, was as a drama and English teacher in the UK state education system in, in secondary school. And I qualified in the late 80s, not long after the national curriculum had been introduced and SATS testing had been introduced um, for all age groups. But nevertheless, the arts were, I felt, still valued in schools. Um, and we had to an extent the freedom to create our own curricula within arts departments, um, within the primary curriculum even more so. So I worked with a theatre company that also that toured schools um, and was able to make arts projects that brought elements of the curriculum together. Uh, there were still theatre companies funded in the UK to do that work with young people that put the arts at the centre of learning. But now I'm speaking to parents and students who are seeing the arts squeezed out, there's another water metaphor, squeezed out of the curriculum by projects that, you know, that audit children's behaviour or um, the, the supposed need to teach children the minutiae of whether they can label elements of, of grammar. Um, and whilst I, I do understand, of course, that it's important to that everyone leaves skills with functional skills that empower them to be part of society and to be able to work, it really seems to me that we've left behind the idea of the arts as a common good within our education system and that we've moved to a place where perhaps only a small elite have access to the arts. And I do think that um, young people are thirsty for the arts, not, not only the arts in their own right and the arts as a means of self-expression but also as a mode of of learning uh, which was why I was really excited mm. to hear about the arts as a mode of learning in Louise's practice with medical students and the arts as a mode of a discursive mode within um, Ruth and, and Megan's project. Um, so we're now going to move on to the slightly more experimental element um, where I'm not going to as a good chair ask questions I'm going to let this happen as a conversation and we're all going to ask each other questions. Um, so I'm literally going to open it to our small floor and please anyone who's an uh, attendee if you would like to put questions in that Q&A um, we'll, we, will, we will come to them. Who would like to begin from our panel? Louise. Yeah I would I would just really love to hear a little bit more from um, Megan and Ruth um, having only met them yesterday and heard about some of their work but when they were talking and describing um, how they were working with people, with water, with each other, and across the arts. Um, uh, it blew me away, really. So, uh, uh, yeah, I would, I would love to just hear a bit more um, about your work, if that would be okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, it wasn't easy. <laughs> so, uh, and especially, you know, when we first started um, working together and Ruth decided to infiltrate my interviews, which is how it felt at the beginning. <laughs> like an invader in my interviews and I don't know if you saw in the in the picture you know we you know you know as an anthropologist I kind of sit back you know it's thick description the whole point is immersion and you just kind of like sit there for years and get the detail and like eventually you'll do something and like I have become increasingly and you know and then you will do your analysis on it and actually you know, it, it can become very, very flat and you can lose the immediacy of it. And so I think I soon became very, very aware that what Ruth could do was stage these really amazing spaces where, you know, we, I could still like get all of that lovely detail. And like, I think the important thing that we've all noticed is being able to hold different people in different positions in the same space and not necessarily have to resolve it, which is actually the kind of nuance that you would, you can only dream of as an ethnographer. So I soon realized that actually she, she was great. She was brilliant. And actually she made me more interested in what I was doing again, because there was, you know, there was still this ability for us together to get this detail. Ruth is quite nerdy anyway. So when she gets into a project, she really, really gets into a project in like quite distressing levels of detail. Like she knows a lot about water pipes. She knows a lot about like she made a cake 
that you know was a you know a, a kind of a geological representation of the colder and it was accurate so should we both have this love and interest and see this importance in detail and really kind of representing and listening to people and then throwing it back but what Ruth gave me was like the confidence and the ability to maybe intervene a little bit more and go, okay, so this is how it is. What if this happened? And what if this happened? So we had this really nice balance by the end, I think, of detail and immersion, but then also being able to stage a space that was like, okay, what's next? So it's kind of like now, but what's going to happen in the future and it and it felt very authentic because we both listened to our participants and it was based on a very um you know a clear understanding of them and that's something that you have to do as a social anthropologist it's kind of within the discipline it's something that Ruth always does in her practice you know she takes people seriously she thinks about where they're coming from and why and that's what you have to do as an anthropologist so there was this really nice kind of similarity but also this radical difference between us which I think meant that the imagining and the work that we did was actually uh, could really speak to people I don't know if Ruth has anything else to yeah um well I mean it, on the flip side it, it was um it was uh, really comforting to kind of work with Megan in a certain in some ways there was lots of um points of tension of course um and that made what made it kind of interesting but I think um the uh leveling and overview without losing the detail and the sort of the methodical approach I would call it in a sense that Megan had whereas I would be kind of quite fiery and I would just be in the conversation be in the moment and then kind of take my gut feeling and kind of run with it and have kind of build upon relationships but there was a kind of steadiness and an overview that Megan kind of gave it that enabled us to kind of carry all this data forward in order to do something with it that actually had roots in like four years of listening to people mm -hmm. and that was kind of really important and so I think in terms of working with people with water and understanding the calder I mean there are millions, I mean, there's just like so many projects, so many good people with so much understanding of flooding in that area, yeah. you know, and it was nerve wracking to go in. I, you know, there was a kind of point of like, what the hell are we doing here? You know, um, and I think what we discovered really fairly rapidly is that actually there is a role for the arts in this situation because we there, there was a lot a lot of people focusing on different elements and there was a lot of sort of coming together to manage but as I think has been brought up in this wider group it was very engineering based it was very technocratic it was very political it was very done it was done within the the, the system it was done with the bureaucratic kind of means and the lack of support and money that people have in these institutions so what mm -hmm. Megan's interviews or and what we discovered as a whole but Megan's interviews really started to kind of tease out was these gray spaces these unspoken spaces these stresses these emotions these kind of like kind of hovering over each other and gelling and or, or frictions which really really did shape how people work together or didn't work together and also revealed the contradictions, the contradictions of the policies, you know, you would have a policy that said one thing and then there would be another policy that would completely contradict that from a water perspective. And water is, is such a fascinating subject for that, especially when you're looking at it at a large scale, because it's all very well kind of coming out with lots of metaphors about how it is and everything. But what it's become is what we've squeezed it into. How we think about it is how we've buried it. We don't think about it very often. You know, how we're trying to deal with it is push it this way or hide mm. it or or manage it from a, a sort of um, logical bureaucratic perspective. Um, it's not. It's a liquid. It's still. Yeah. It's fast. It's <laughs> it's. A, yeah. And so so it, what our role became, I think, what I would say is to take that whole picture and to show the the fuzz the mess the all of the bits in between which then reflected kind of back on yeah. the situations they were do that they were struggling with 
off the back of that, can I, because I mean, when when Ruth always talks about this and when we kind of were like beginning to see these like things that didn't quite fit in in these grey areas, all I could think about, because obviously my research before had been um, taking place in clinical environments, all I could think about was evidence-based medicine, um, having to note everything down, having 10 minutes with a patient, having all of these, and it, like there was something there about the structure of the organisations and then the way that the people in those organisations that were expected to work, that really reminds me of the way that teachers are expected to work, clinicians are expected to work. There's something, you know, this bureaucratic counting that kind of sucks the life out of the system, including the people in that system. I just thought there's a real similarity there. And I think our project, when Luigi were talking about kind of maybe what what you allow the medical students to do. I think in some of our later work, so when we were developing the common waters policy, that was as much as anything, a kind of therapeutic space for people to be able to, you know, not just say what they feel, but to, to be with their own uncertainty and their discomfort. And I thought, it, I don't know, it felt very, really rang true to me, those later sessions with kind of how you were describing your interactions with the medical students. And it all seems to be a response to this, you know, Maria will have loads to say on this, this kind of, I this is what. <laughs> I want to make a point and maybe I'm confusing things, but to me, it really links to what uh, Ruth and Megan was talking about. Uh, I love the way in which you were describing this tension between holding some specialist knowledge. You know, you were saying, Meg, how Ruth really knew about the pipes and, you know, the sort of technical things. But on the other hand, uh, she was also really free to let other kinds of knowledge to come in. And that was exactly the response that, for example, we had when we went and interviewed the psychiatrists who were taking part in the project I was, say, I was talking before of, of coming to an art gallery to, to develop their clinical practice, which was that space where they had some kind of specialist knowledge that was useful, but at the same time also didn't have a lot of knowledge about other things, mm -hmm. about the art objects, for example, or about some of the uh, emotions that were brought up by these art objects and how other people reacted to them. And this space really allowed for this uh, new thing to emerge. And it didn't have to be at the expense of the other knowledge, because that's the problem, I think, that often we think, OK, if we let this third space be available where many perspectives can be brought in and we can be uh, perhaps more vulnerable as well as playful with our um, connections and emotions, then we lose, you know, all those other things that we've learned. But actually, we will not lose them. We will make something better out of them. Yeah. And I, sorry, Bridget, I'll just say one last thing and then I <laughs> Uh, I wanted to say that for me, there is also a beautiful metaphor between water, you know, the fact that water um, is this thing that we bury under the ground, but actually we are made of water. So we should really take an interest <laughs> in water because it's the majority of what we are made of. And similarly, you know, this emotional um, aspect of ourselves, that's what we are made of. And we seem to bury it somewhere and just go off and talk about sleep and appetite without really thinking about all the other things that we are made of yeah sorry Bridget no 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 not at all I was just agreeing Louise yeah yeah just did quite a few sort of strands of, of resonance um <clears throat> talking about being with their own uncertainty um and that being uh, so this whole sort of within the medical education striving after knowing everything and thinking the students thinking they have to know everything and and it you know as a practitioner I often explain that there's so much that we don't know as we're alongside our patients and even um there's some lovely research it relates to therapists rather than um doctors but they found that those that had more self-love rather than self-hatred that's not surprising but those that had more self-doubt rather than self-confidence actually had better outcomes for their clients and to me that maybe makes sense when you think about something that I talked to the students about narrative humility that sense that we can never fully know the other story so we come and we listen and we try to understand but we don't know it and when you're holding it in that way when you're dealing with someone else with all the complexity of their illness lived experience coming in that more <laughs> humble way perhaps allows better outcomes 
for the people that we're working with. And another sort of metaphor that I um, talk about that, that relates to this sort of being in that uncertain space is the students, you know, they even from the first year, they're sort of aware of the systems that they then are going to be working in and the challenges and the pressure of time and the pressure of, uh, of all the pressures. But uh, I often talk about only dead fish going with the flow. And actually, if one wants to be in those spaces, we um, have to choose that because the system, like Maria was saying, does push us into certain ways of being with other people. Um, uh, if you just allow yourself as a clinician to be molded by the system. And the final thing that just relates, and again, I said this this morning to the students, to this kind of uh, being in the uncertainty and the mess and the fuzz that we've sort of heard about and maybe Keats' idea of negative capability, which I sometimes talk about, that I just love this, um, I think it's William Cowper who said, knowledge is proud that it knows so much and wisdom humble that it knows no more. And I think there's a journey you know, obviously students have to learn a lot of facts and have to have a lot of knowledge, but actually when they get to the point, and often they are wiser in their first year because they are more humble anyway, they're sort of coming, feeling, knowing that they don't know, but the risk is that by the time you get sort of further on in your career that there's that sense that we do know and, and, and the wisdom might be lacking, although the knowledge, some of the knowledge is there. I, I think um, there was some things that uh, I really drew some parallels from our project on that, which is around certainty. And this is all speculation, but you know, there was there was such a um, strength, but also fight back around um, engineering um, solutions and also modeling um, issues around flooding, as opposed to kind of a much more um, uh, difficult kind of measured solutions such as natural flood management so the idea was that you know as a big institution as a big organization responsible for um flooding so around you know so the environment agency you know to to be able to calculate and give numbers and probabilities and then to create a solution which could also be justified through numbers there's there was a sort of safe a, a perceived safety in it a perceived sort of like thing that like we we've got this we can handle this and it's it doesn't always work and then modeling um i.e kind of putting like the probabilities of flooding is it's such a complex thing especially over a large area that once the variables are really really wide then you really are kind of like you just don't know if that's going to be uh if that, that answer is going to be the right one and so it just it just what you were saying louise was just made me think about this kind of like wider confidence of kind of like needing to know because flooding is like the emotional and the psychological impact of not only being flooded but waiting to be flooded repeatedly um is 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 horrendous and so the the kind of weird dynamic of the role and responsibility of the authority to reassure and then on the other hand you know megan you know we were talking a lot you know, and you were interviewing kind of like the volunteers who deal with the kind of grassroots day-to-day -day of the, the sort of flood management and flood response unit and you know, all the voluntary stuff you know it was just it, it felt like quite a different language at times and a quite a different kind of energy I don't know if you wanted to add to yeah that. I mean it's a it is a different language and it's a different way of problematizing and even conceiving of what the problem is that's that's one thing so you there are lots of different ways of managing um, flooding so there's natural flood management and there's the heavy engineering and the natural flood management you can never measure it like you're just never going to be able to measure it but the but and the other benefits to natural flood management, for example, are biodiversity increase, like making the land better, you know, this, the integrity of the soil better. But again, all of those things are so dispersed, you can't measure them. Added on to that, because there's no measurement um, and because it's not kind of the way that it's done traditionally, there's then not much money to do it. So then you just have this stacking up of kind of no evidence, no knowledge, it's not quite there. It, it's on the fringes and, you know, natural flood management is definitely something that the government supports, but when it comes down to doing it, 
like as the way to really tackle and engage with flooding it's not necessarily done and there's a very much a reliance on voluntary organizations or charities with small projects you have to do it in a very piecemeal patchwork way so there is kind of this relationship I think between what you can say with certainty and then the resource that you can put into it and as we all know a lot of the good stuff is the stuff that you can't necessarily say with any certainty <laughs> you know a lot of the good stuff in flood management is the fact that you will plant trees and then you will you know people will go out and plant trees and it will be a brilliant experience for them and then they'll start to understand kind of like the colder and the catchment and the wildlife there and then they'll start to understand the flooding a little bit more and actually by doing that it might make them less worried about it it might give them a sense of control all of that stuff is never going to be measured, but that's the stuff. So then it just ends up not getting done over and over and over again, or not getting done at scale how it should be. Because, you know, in terms of climate change, we're, you know, it's pretty serious. <laughs> we need to do something radical and drastic now, but, you know. Louise, you wanted to come in there? Yeah. Sorry, I keep getting overexcited, different things you're saying, but but Ruth, you're talking about authority and needing to know, and, and just on that one, um, a concept that I quite often talk to the students about is about confidently not knowing. So, you know, when the patient is there and there are things that no one knows as a clinician, there are things that we can go away and look up, but you, it's not, it, it's, it's okay to say, I don't know, I'm going to look it up. And certainly as a patient, I would prefer that um, as an approach. And, 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 and it's reassuring to the students who often feel like in the future, they will have to know everything. So, so that was one thing. But the um, other thing around this idea, and Megan, you're talking about natural flood management and not being able to measure it. Again, big resonance with, so I invited an artist and a poet to, for over about three years, to be working with my patients in the practice. Um, and they had 12 sessions in, in groups with, with the artist and the poet. And uh, we did look at various measurements, like they had less consultations and reduced um, psychi psychiatric medications. But what really interested me was actually how lives were changed. And again, very difficult to measure and to make the kind of, in the end, we ran out of sort of places to find funding for it. It was in 2006 to 2009. So it's kind of before social prescribing or much social prescribing was going on. But, you know, people moved away from difficult neighbors. They um, built friendships. So there's three three ladies that kind of started going to the cinema together, and I think are still are in contact and doing mm -hmm. things together. Um, the people would start courses, um, just move on in their lives in different ways. But but how do you measure? You know, we know that loneliness is is toxic. But how do you measure how much less health problems you have and how much money you save down the line because you're no longer lonely? And that that's where the case can be quite different. And I think there's big parallels between what you were saying with planting trees and you know, all of those parallel benefits. Yeah. I mean, I would say, like, I know we can't just spend loads of money. <laughs> like I do understand that. But I mean, I think the question quickly becomes for me, but you just have to spend money on some stuff, right? So <laughs> You know, we, we're constantly driving, like, I don't have to tell you, like, cost effectiveness. That's the measure, right? It, it is around the application of the best available evidence. But really what that means is cost effectiveness. And so I think a lot of the time, you know, I would like to resist the measurement a little bit or not have measurement in numbers, have measurement as in you being able to say, well, I know that woman uh, moved away from her neighbour and now she's a lot happier. There we go. That could be a form of measurement, but it's not because it's mm. not it doesn't fit with metrics of cost effectiveness or, you know, OK, well, you know, she didn't she only came to see Louise five times last year instead of 20. Great. You know, it's mm. which actually probably would be another side effect of it. You could have both. But yeah. 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 Maria, go. Yeah. What it makes me think is that um, there is a difference between knowing and measuring. And, uh, you know, th there is like uh, the, the not knowing position, which is absolutely uh, a very important creative place to be. But there are also kind of things we know. We know that if you, you know, pump a lot of dirt into the water, it will create a lot of damage to the environment. But what we can do perhaps very well is measure the lack of damage, as we were saying, you know, that we do to people. 
uh, if, if we do that kind of behavior, but we know that damage will be done. And it's like, we are, you know, we lack common sense. Maybe that's why we lack commons good, you know, because we like common sense that we are waiting for things to be wasted or too late. And it's the same thing with mental health. We are waiting for people to be really unwell for then making, um, helping them. So my uh, metaphor now with students, when I talk about the importance of prevention in mental health and how much, uh, first of all, the arts could help with prevention and that there are scientific studies on very big populations that show that the arts, um, engagement with the arts prevents uh, mental health problems in childhood as well as, as in adulthood. And uh, what I say to my students is that we are like a town where we leave all the roads broken up with lots of holes and potholes and whatever. And then lots of people get their legs broken because they fall into the holes. And then we rush them into hospital and we say, oh, we don't have enough resources now to repair all your legs, you know. But what about keeping the roads properly in the first place? Then maybe some people would break their legs, but they would be so few that we would have had the resources to look after them properly. And I think with mental health, with all the psychosocial factors that have been well proved to cause um mental health difficulties i think we are doing exactly this and i think the arts are not going to solve uh, poverty or racism uh, in a direct way but i think that engagement with the arts would create a much more um, creative society and a society perhaps that puts the values uh, somewhere else uh, and then some of those problems would be i think uh, less less frequent that makes me oh sorry go on yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna say something really really quick which is i think the interesting thing i think what i'd hope that the common waters policy has done is it's made people maybe think about what values they want next in the future because we could lay out you know one of the processes that led up to that was us going what are the difficulties and what are the commonalities between you and this goes back to what you said earlier as well around these spaces they can be spaces of of commonality as well so I just think it's really really interesting that you know these places did become the spaces that we created as part of the project did actually become a place where people could step back and go these are my the actually these are the values that I want to pick to collectively with this group here and this group here and then this is how we're going to go forward and I thought that was really really that was a really interesting effect of the work yeah I, I think there was something around um uh, Maria you you talked about knowing and um and sort of like measuring and I, I'd like to kind of bring in the the commodification of something and in relation to expertise because I think if you think I mean there's so many different waters um but you know the idea that um of agency around water is a really strange one because if you look at a wider system um you know it's been commodified from a drinking and sewage perspective so how do you have agency over that and and so your desire for um uh sort of being involved just it just dissolves and also the the expertise there isn't room for expertise at least in that system so the expertise becomes somewhere else and that was what becomes really interesting so the expertise becomes through the leisure so that the anglers or the wild swimmers or the people who have been flooded who have a sort of you know anger around that understandably so I think there's something around ownership and um, the commodification but with water it's a really it, it's a complex system it's not a thing it's something that is around us in us and that we're living with so we have to manage it but the way that we manage so many things like the fact that there's lots of us there's lots of building it's cheaper to build on floodplains all of these things are kind of shaping and 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 the, the water becomes the secondary thing until it becomes really loud and as one of our uh, um, participants said comes back and bites you on the bum and becomes mm -hmm. essentially not cost effective <laughs> yeah right and then and it says water says sod you and I'm going to cost you this much money 
and actually it really has to do a lot of damage or has to be in a very important place or people have to shout very very loudly for even that to be done and what becomes interesting is then it gets flips back to an adopt for, for the most part has flipped back to an engineering solution which often can create more problems it just creates more problems downstream just not where the people shouted most and that was an interesting thing that you know came up with a calder if you look at the kind of demographic and the, and the sit you know from upstream to downstream and who lives where and who shouts loudest and how they're most effective so you know i think the commodification and the, the economics of it still drive the decisions. And so in order to kind of like talk about expertise, you're talking about really about relational kind of stuff. You need to kind of create those spaces for people to come together outside of that system to have that conversation to say exactly what Megan was talking about. What do we value? What's important? <laughs> It would be really nice to hear, um, just noticing in chat that Josh Cohen has asked um, about the about the models um, and how some of these huge questions of resource and community, how 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 they how the models work, because just listening to you talk and then th and seeing Josh's question and then thinking about those images of those models and how tiny and detailed they are and how uh, I'm constantly working with students within drama projects where my students work with young people of the idea of going from the very particular to the broader universal questions. So I'm just wondering if we could answer or maybe talk around Josh's question of how those models work. To, it, it, in the project um okay so i can answer that briefly um so the base of the model was the catchment and and on it mm -hmm. was called the the river and the canal and each of the miniatures came out of the conversations and interviews that megan had the way they worked would they would be workshop based and the workshops would be scripted and the participants would have to take various roles on so there would be a numerous amounts of situations but for example it might be that the group was split into two. One would represent people that have been flooded, one would represent Yorkshire water, and then they would have to problem solve. So there was that. And then we would start off something simple and personal, like pick a miniature that means something to you and tell a story around it, put it on the base. How does that relate to that one? So it was very much about kind of cause and effect. It was very much about different people's voices and perspectives, but it was also about reimagining. And it was also about being quite playful you know like really playful about some really quite you know um emotive situations and things and of course that went downstream as well so the conversations we had with the model in hebden bridge were very different to the ones that we had in murfield to the ones that we had in in, in castleford thank you thanks thanks um we've got um a lot of really interesting questions now in q a and in chat um i might start to turn to those and uh, uh, move us through them uh, were there any other things that people wanted to say just now in response to what's just been said i'll try and pull some of the questions together then and again many apologies if we don't get through to all of them in, in just uh, under half an hour um, but um, in terms of a few questions that were explicitly um, directed at maria's perspective but again i think we can we can broaden them out um, across the panel one lorna v said that she'd love to hear more from maria about how other psychiatrists are responding to her move away from on medicalization um, and then oh I'm not sure if I can go up and down in my Q&A I seem to have um, no, sorry I'm going to go down the chat um, sorry for the pause I there was a, a question in chat you know Bridget I sorry I answered the question quickly because I saw that the person who was asking it was gonna oh, go away. oh I see but I see would you mind 
No, no, that, I, oh, I see. So if we answer, that's interesting, you Zoom technique for me. If we answer question in words, then they disappear. Um, <laughs> but Maria, would you mind just telling us your answer for, to, to that other question, as well as perhaps addressing um, Lorna's interest in, in how uh, the move away from medicalization is responded to by, by other psychiatrists? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not the only one, you know, <laughs> I'm not like the pioneer of this. I know, of course. There are many mm. clinicians, not only psychiatrists, also uh, other mental health professionals who um, are pushing for what is called a paradigmatic shift, uh, moving away mm. from uh, the biologization. But I want to make a point that I try to make now um, mm. uh, as much as I can around the idea that biology in psychiatry is about medicating people. And I want to say I'm not against medication um, as uh, one of the ways in which we can help people who are suffering at different points in time. Mm -hmm. I'm against the idea that psychiatry um, deals with diseases of the brain and that medication is the main tool to cure those diseases and sometimes the only tool. That's what I'm against. Um, so in response to Lorna, there are many other people who are um, critical like me, and there are of course other people, uh, especially in the dominant um, institutions that regulate um, the way in which ma mainstream psychiatry works, that would not accept this and are really pushing for this um, reductionist biological view. And uh, for me, there is a real uh, mistake that should be glaringly obvious to everyone, which is that um, biology is really ecology. You know, if you um, think about the way in which any organism works, they work within an environment, a context, which is basically very fundamental to their survival. You can't like have a plant that lives in isolation in some kind of vacuum or an animal that lives in isolation. So when we talk about social aspects and psychosocial aspects of mental health and mental illness, we're really talking about biology. We're not talking about some fluffy thing, uh, spiritual or, you know, whatever, um, religious. We're really talking about mm -hmm. biology because we are social uh, animals and what happens between uh, ourselves in societies um, is very biological, I think. Mm -hmm. So that is the one thing. And the other thing in response to the question in the, in the question and answer, which was about how do I see um, uh, mental health being practiced in this liminal... Uh, or in the liminal, yeah. yeah. It's basically, you know, there are many models of that, uh, not many, but there are a few really robust and good models of that. One of them is open dialogue which is a, a form of uh, um, creating services for mental health, which are centered on dialogical practice and always involve the system uh, because uh, the idea that comes from family therapy is that there isn't a diseased individual. There is a problem in a system that might manifest itself as one particular individual suffering more than others. But the problem is in a system, is not in the individual. So open dialogue, you can, there are quite a lot of information about it um, available online. The other one, I'm a very... Um, uh, fun, or sorry, I should find a better word, but very supportive of is uh, um, a framework called the Power Threat Meaning Framework, which is a document produced by the British Psychological Society, which foregrounds psychosocial aspects of mental health. And it brings together a lot of evidence that this is really what causes psychiatric problems, is not um, some kind of molecule going wrong, is the psychosocial environments in which we live and we have lived. Um, and uh, prevention, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, doing uh, much more prevention. And I really wanted actually, hopefully, if Bridget, you'll have a chance to bring that in at some point but work that artists do with children um, in really creating spaces for children to learn about the world and about themselves in a much more rounded way and really learn about uh, emotions and relationships with other people through emotions rather than only learn um, the ABC or you know how to do maths calculation. It's very important. It's not an either or, but it's not the only thing that uh, children need to learn or to be exposed to, yeah. Absolutely, no, I'd love to speak to that. I think Megan was had something. 
no, she didn't. Okay, no, no, no problem. No, um, I mean, currently with our, uh, the students that Maria and I work with together on the MSc in Creative Arts and Mental Health, we have a, an optional class called Theatre for Young People, which works with young people directly. So we think about um, uh, the arts uh, and, and we've had to do that online this year. So we've run Zoom sessions and um, artist uh, mentoring with, with young people, uh, creating arts projects for and with young people, very much led by them. And we're working with a company called um, Theatre Troop, um, who work with young people who've experienced trauma and who've had attachment issues. Um, and quite often Theatre Troop work in pupil referral units. So um, schools that, uh, young people are sent to when they've been excluded from mainstream schools um, and, and I was quite dismayed to find that the curriculum there feels even narrower than the mainstream curriculum so last year before Covid when I was able to go in and observe my students working um, through these theatre projects with these young people um, that was the only arts intervention in, in one people referral unit it was the only arts intervention that those young people had had all year, so, so they had an art room, but they didn't seem to be using it. Um, the uh, focus was so tightly on very narrow um, uh, tick box uh, uh, attainment, uh, if, you, if you like. But um, I, I suppose for me, it, it links to these ideas that we've been having, which I don't think are romantic ideas about free flowing emotion, immersion in, in art. They are absolutely conducive to learning, but they're frightening maybe for bureaucratic systems. And this seems to have come up again and again, the idea that sometimes the arts like water leak and they, and they flow and they don't quite fit the systems that have been set up to deliver particular things. Um, I, I, I found that what we offer those young people or what theatre troupe and my students are offering the, those young people is something that comes from them um, and learning is curated around that but it starts from them and it flows through them it, it, if you like and quite often and, and actually I, I don't think it's just now actually um, I, I found this at various points in my career working with young people through the arts someone always says but will we get enough done um, and, and, and there's this big heap of, of pointers that we have or, or, or this big big weighted knowledge that we have to put inside the heads of young people and will we have time to do that? Whereas actually I found working on arts projects and that's why I was so excited to hear about uh, Ruth and Megan's because some of those techniques that you're using to get people to think and discuss and to shift positions feel very much like some of the theatre and education projects that used to be funded in this country to work with young people. Um, so uh, I find that actually an incredibly efficient way of learning, um, that extraordinary uh, amounts of learning can be done through that bringing together and starting with what a young person uh, already knows. Um, Aoife Monks in chat had a question that I'm going to link to this. She was really interested in what Ruth and Megan said about bureaucracy. Um, and she was wondering if Megan might reflect on how some of those principles might also apply to how higher education and universities operate and what artists might offer to intervene. I was I saw Eva's question when you were speaking and I yeah. made the connect and then I also realized when you were talking about education Louise and Maria are also teaching we're going like this and we're all going like this which is you know you know what what do you do when people get to university like you know um and we like the most satisfying learning experience for a student is if they've built their own learning experience and I don't mean I don't want to use the word experience as in student experience I mean they have had a bit of a struggle supported by somebody their teacher and then they have worked out how they learn best or how they can make something best and I just feel we have completely lost that from mm -hmm. higher education you're not allowed to struggle you're, you know, we assess people a lot, you know, 
you, you want them to learn kind of graduate attributes, but the graduate attributes are something that you have to be able to then put into a form and say, I am now at this, so I'm a global citizen, or I can do this, or I can do this. And actually, you know, it's all just kind of been slimmed down and kind of made into this slight production line, I guess. And I think there are what what the amazing thing about kind of what Ruth does and the kind of education that you were uh, explaining, Bridget, is really, really important. It's building the bridges you go. And that ability to build the bridges you go and be like, OK, almost do like a needs assessment. You know, what's the problem here? Is it a problem that I know the answer to already where I can just pick an off the shelf methodology and answer it? No, probably not, because that's not life. Unfortunately, it's having the confidence to know that you can kind of build your own solution and your own learning space. And that comes from, you know, yeah, having, you know, universities, you know, that are inclusive and open and where people are welcome and people have to be welcomed by there being multiple different forms of assessing things, different ways of learning and different ways of interacting. You know, I mean, Louise and Maria will know from the medical curriculum that is the most intense fill them with knowledge, fill them with knowledge, fill them with knowledge curriculum. And yet, you know, some students who I've taught who've gone on to be doctors have said, I didn't really know how to be a doctor until I left medical school, <laughs> because that's not it. And I'm sure this is the same for graduates from lots of other disciplines as well. And I think there is a real issue within, you know, that I think a lot of people at QM are trying to fight against in how we teach and what our philosophy of teaching is. And it, it and I think what an arts perspective does is it gives you a really, really, really clear process or gives you permission to make your own process, which is really important. Yeah, I, I'd just like to sort of reiterate that, but also say it, it's not about a clear process. This is about not having a point to necessarily get to. And this is all about, for me, this is all about a balance between listening and this knowledge. Who holds this knowledge? And, and so much of what all we're talking about here is that there is this knowledge held by a series of experts that is given and may be consulted with and you can choose between these two different solutions and you know this is completely the opposite to what we're talking about and you're you know you know, it just reminds me of I've got a two and a half year old and we're you know it's it's all of the parenting books and all of the rest of it it's the same argument it's about kind of saying how do you how do you, um they get autonomy you know, how do they make their decisions, you know, as opposed to kind of us guiding them in such a restrictive way constantly that they don't have any space to make their own decisions or to see beyond the options that you're giving them. Mm -hmm. And I think all of the all of what seems to be happening here is uh, creating these spaces is in order to listen to one another. And hopefully these people, obviously, in these groups have commonality between them, whether they've been flooded or they're medical professionals or, you know, and and they are self discovering, you know, discovering between themselves in this sort of safer space, using yeah. a new language and, and creating kind of empathy with each other in order to kind of say, actually, this is what is important. And so I would be like really questioning kind of you know, we really are on a production line, aren't we? In all of these things, I think, did Megan, did you say production line? You know, because we, you've commodified something, therefore you create a production line to kind of hit that, and and therefore you need to educate and train people in such a way that they fit that production line, and all of these spaces outside that deal with kind of a, a more human <laughs> kind of way of relating to each other, but it could be seen as and uh, not fitting in threatening you know yeah. kind of um messy problematic but actually it's it's actually enriching and there are probably answers in there really fundamental answers in there that we need very rapidly to deal with the breakdown of everything that's kind of happening around us uh, sorry, I bridget i'm jumping no. in. i'm sorry i know louise has got her hand up but i wanted to say yeah. we really lack common Please. sense when we let water be commodified, because I repeat it, we are made of water. And when we let mental health be commodified, because mental health is commodified, you know, it's, very, it's a very uh, prosperous business. If you want to become rich, probably, I mean, I'm not a financial expert, but probably invest in some kind of pharmaceutical company that delivers mental health products. So yeah, we, we lack common sense. Thank you, Maria Louise. 
Yeah, just coming in on the sort of higher education um, and what's going on here, I, I often like to use the term or think about the term educere, which is the Latin underpinning of educate, which means to draw out or to lead out as what we might be doing. So we're helping, we're sort of leading it out of the learning, out of the, the students and what they'll bring to their future practice. And one of the things that the students often say, and, and um, after the two week student select component with the arts is I learned more about, well, this is specifically what one student said, but many say it, I learned more about myself in the last two weeks than I have in my whole 21 years um, prior to this, because there was space for me to talk and explore. And a student today, just to like bring the student voice into this conversation, said, some, said uh, I, I made notes as she was talking, I was shocked at how comfortable we are with each other, despite the Zoom platform that we comfortably share emotion and feelings and everyone is so respectful and gentle. It makes the space so much more meaningful and conducive for insightful sharing. Mm -hmm. But those spaces are rare is what they say. We don't have those spaces. In general, we don't encounter those spaces as part of our learning. This is a, a rare treat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, there's uh, a, an interesting conversation now going on uh, in the chat around assessment within, within even the performing arts um, and how can we move from formal assessment um, uh, to include other forms of assessment which encourage creativity and multimodal contribution to, to learning. Um, and then um, uh, we've also got some questions uh, in the Q&A around from uh, Daniel Meyer around whether we believe in the idea of, of madness or mental illness as genius and whether it's damaging to romanticize mental illness as, as being creative, uh, as being creative fuel. Lots of questions he has about that um and and i i guess my response to that is that um if we start from people's experience we by no means suggest that say someone's mental distress if they are categorized as mentally ill or if they're suffering mental distress that that by no means makes them instantly a, a, an artistic genius um, but i guess some of the modes of artistic learning that we're beginning to think about is does center on that idea of the expert by experience um, and so as whereas in answer to daniel's questions are around the idea of madness and genius um, some people might make art around their mental health or illness that is brilliant and some people might be extremely damaged by their mental health experiences and not be able to create at all um, so i i wouldn't say there was a sort of single answer to that that if you like but certainly i think the privileging of, for example, in some kinds of mental health um, education, the health service user experience um, and the child centred learning that I guess I'm missing um, from from some of the encounters I now have with with, with young people in their schools um, does assume not that everybody's experience makes them a genius um, or even particularly good at art in, in a particular way, uh, but makes them the authors of their own authors of their own creation and, uh, and knowledge in a way that also I would keep arguing makes them better able to take on other knowledge. Um, anyone else? <laughs> uh, sorry Bridget, I, can I say something about that? Um, mm. And I also was looking at the other question by Sebastian around, you know, why are art and water so uh, fundamental? And mm -hmm. I was thinking about what I was saying before, that uh, if you um, come like me from knowledge that comes from within psychoanalysis and the psychology of the unconscious, you know that a lot of our mental life is situated within emotions, like a lot of our bodily life is situated within uh, water. So we are composed in our mental life for a majority of the um, activity by things that have got to do with emotions. And mm -hmm. we know, I mean, Aristotle said it, but actually a study was, was published in, um, uh, I think it is 2021 by someone who's called Danese, who basically proved uh, through a, um, an, an experiment, yeah, an empirical study, that basically meaning making is fundamental to the way in which we uh, link experience to mental health. So that is not so much the objective um, experience that makes us mentally ill, but is the way in which we 
make meaning out of that experience. So mm. the arts are just that place where um, emotional uh, aspects of our psychic life are engaged, uh, just because they are that place, like, you know, um, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I can't find the right metaphor now, but there is the emotional engagement and there is the meaning making. As we've seen, for example, from uh, Louise's uh, work and the example she gave uh, us, uh, through the arts, someone discovers something about the meaning that they are making around uh, their uh, emotional experiences. So in that sense, they are fundamental because they mediate uh, anything that then uh, relates to our sense of identity and our um, uh, mental health intended in the, at the level of, of emotionality. And so, sorry, I will say another uh, last thing, but I don't want to take away the, uh, the last five minutes around the mad, the myth of the mad artist, mm -hmm. that if this artistic space is the space where we make meaning, then it is a tool that people who, um, the tool of us with our internal conflicts and, you know, uh, many different nuances to our emotional experiences can use to actually try and, and, and know ourselves better, create a sense of identity. However, sometimes, as Bridget was saying, um, we might not be able to reach out to that medium, you know, and we might not always, um, yeah, be able to make the most of it, I guess. Thank I think you. I'd, I'd quickly just like to kind of also add that the art, for me, it, um, emotions is core of it, but it, it's, it's not, for me necessarily art is about expressing or accessing emotions um it you know it's so why it's so much wider it can be so many things and that's the joy of art now it, it can do and seem like or even kind of disguise itself as other things and there's a lot of stuff around you know reflection and collective narrative or enabling art enabling putting certain areas of life next to another area of life or a certain person next to another person in a juxtaposition that you would never have in any other space or the right or the space to use a language in a certain way that you could never ever do that so I think it's the kind of the there's a sort of boundary in some kinds of art that is is much wider and it's a very precious boundary because within that space you are allowed to make the rules up <laughs> much more yeah, yeah. And, and, and and i think yeah. that's the core and emotion is part of that and i think one of the reasons we pick up on emotion so much in art is because it isn't anywhere else <laughs> or if it is anywhere else it's kind of possibly kind of shoveled through a certain system or commodified or you know all of the rest of it so i think it is about that autonomy of learning it's about that conversation um and it's about that space where maybe you would meet people that you want, you know, or talk in a way that you've never talked before. Yeah, and I mean, I've we're got going to say, to to George, oh. sorry, to, one, one second, I'm going to go straight on to you, just to say we've got three more minutes. Um, so perhaps if I ask uh, Megan to respond and then I just come back briefly to, to Louise and Maria for a, a final reflection. Um, it, I thought an hour and a half would be quite long. It actually feels as though we could do with another hour and a half. But but Megan, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say that was the that was the brilliant thing working with Reese because you know when you do a bit of research, it's like it has to be re rooted within the you know what we know already and la 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 and you know and then a lot of the time you kind of end up writing all that up and then you can't say anything interesting because you've got to kind of like root it in the whatever. And what Ruth, like I was allowed to do with Ruth was just be like, I think that kind of works, and I don't really know why, but let's shove it next to that, and then we could do it and. And there is, we could make the rules up when we came. And I think that's why, for me, it made the research richer and more interesting and challenged me more than, you know, if I was just doing it on my own, which would have been boring. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria says to hand over to Louise for the final word. <laughs> I guess just to to resonate with that, that the arts and this is what I've been exploring, you know, through research and I'd love to continue to explore and have conversations um, with you guys about it. But what, what do the arts do and what do they bring to higher education? And 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 I've come up with things like um, uh, new ways of seeing it invites um, 
can and gives language of connection so people can create and share things that they wouldn't otherwise say it invites engagement with metaphor ways to express things that otherwise couldn't be said um to uh um yeah engage with ways of knowing in new ways which um, empowers develops and and has a, so much to bring to practitioner ways of knowing um yeah mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, as Maria pointed out, um, Sebastian Muller, uh, uh, an undergrad drama student at Queen Mary, said he was compelled by the idea, this is in the uh, Q&A, that um, the art is as necessary as water and wanted us all to speak a little bit more about that. Well, we haven't got time all to speak a little bit more about that now, but I hope that this conversation has begun to answer that. Um, it's been fascinating to hear about these projects, to use watery metaphors to describe them um, and to think and to think about the ways in which the arts flow around and flood um, and uh, leak into um, bureaucracies um, and rigid ways of thinking. Um, so I hope that um, that's been exciting for people to listen to. It's been incredibly exciting for me to participate in. Um, and I'd just like to say thanks to all the attendees for listening. This format hasn't um, been allowed to, hasn't allowed us to see you, uh, but it's been great to um, see who some of you are uh, in chat. Many thanks uh, for coming and many, many thanks to our panelists um, for uh, offering their work today. Thank you very much indeed.